Welcome to our Clean Water Wednesday webinar series. Um, we're so excited to be able to offer these webinars to our monitors, our friends, and the clean water community to learn about clean water issues. Um, I'm Emily Bialis. I'm the Chesapeake Monitoring Outreach Coordinator. I will be our cruise director today. I have a few housekeeping items before we get started, and I turn it over to our lovely co-presenters. Um, first things first, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available um, on our webinar page on both the IWA.org website and also on the Isaac Walton League YouTube channel. So you can keep an eye on our website for information on those recordings and about upcoming webinars. We are slowing down our webinar series. We're going to be doing it about once a month now as opposed to every week. Um, but still keep an eye out for new webinars. And then just some housekeeping for during the presentation. Um, if you have a question during this presentation, you can type into the chat box or the question box, whichever it is you see. Um, and it will be, um, you'll have an option to ask those questions through text, but um, we're not going to answer those questions until the end of the presentation and I will um, moderate those questions and ask them to Krista and Svetlana. Um, the webinar should run about an hour, including that time for question and answer. Um, so sit back and relax. And, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Krista and Svetlana. They both work for the Bureau of Environmental Services in the city of Portland and they're going to tell you more about that. Okay. Um, well, good afternoon for most of you. Good morning from Portland. It's earlier here. Um, my name's Krista, and I work for a program called Clean Rivers Education. Um, I actually used to work with Emily. Um, so uh, the main part of my work that I do is environmental education. So typically, uh, most of my job is working with school groups in the Portland area, um, doing classroom lessons around water quality. Um, I teach about macroinvertebrates, native plants, invasive plants, um, stormwater and wastewater. And then I also lead field trips to local natural areas uh, around the Portland area. And for this presentation, um, Svetlana and I are going to be co-presenting. I'm going to do the first half kind of talking about um, why we have green infrastructure in Portland, uh, the history of the Portland um, sewer stormwater system. Uh, and then Svetlana is going to talk a little bit more about actual green infrastructure that we use in Portland and then um, volunteer programs. So I'll pass it off to her to do an intro. Hi everyone, um, I'm Svetlana Hedin and I provide educational tours and do outreach to the public about Portland's green infrastructure. I also uh, manage the Green Street Steward Program, which is a voluntary program for businesses, residents and nonprofits to adapt and look after <clears throat> our uh, infrastructure here. Um, I'll be providing more details about that particular program program in a little bit. Okay, so um, Svetlana and I both work for the Bureau of Environmental Services, which we'll mostly refer to as BES. Um, and for those of you not familiar with um, city of Portland or kind of Pacific Northwest area, we are the um, sewer and stormwater utility. Um, our name is a little vague, but um, we provide sewage and stormwater collection and treatment services for Portland's current and future needs. So we do a lot of planning. Uh, we protect public health, water quality in the environment, and we implement actions that promote healthy watersheds. So uh, we do a lot of watershed restoration projects, uh, working to help make streams that are um, salmon spawning um, capable. And we do a lot of outreach uh, we hold some permits with the um, EPA and the DEQ, um, so the state and federal agencies to help keep rivers clean and healthy. I'm just gonna talk about a little 
bit about some of the definitions of words we're gonna throw around a lot today. Um, so I'm gonna talk a lot today about pervious surfaces and impervious surfaces. Um, so pervious surfaces being ones that allow water to flow through, uh, and that's really important because when water flows through soil and rocks and whatnot, it actually gets naturally filtered. Um, before it reaches down into the groundwater. So any kind of contamination that it might have picked up um, stays in the soil and can break down over time. Whereas those impervious surfaces like roads or parking lots or rooftops, um, they don't allow the water to soak in and that water is gonna get um, transported towards a storm drain. Um, and there's a couple of places that can end up. Um, just to note, pervious surfaces, not all pervious surfaces are equal. So um, the picture that I chose to show here is like a community garden. We really encourage landscaping with like native plants because they're really accustomed to the climate that we have here in Portland, Oregon. So really dry summers, really wet winters. Um, lawns technically are a pervious surface. However, a lot of people tend to put like fertilizers or pesticides or herbicides on that. Uh, and that can kind of rinse off and end up um, going down to storm drains anyway. So we kind of prefer the native plants. Uh, so this um, slide, I hope it's big enough for you all to see. Um, this is just an overview of the different types of sewer systems that we have typically in cities. So uh, on the left-hand column, uh, it's called the MS4, standing for the Municipal Separate Stormwater Sewer System. Uh, and those systems mean that there's one set of pipes for wastewater or sewage. So thinking anything that leaves a drain um, at your house, business, restaurant, hospital, anything that goes down a drain is getting pumped towards a treatment plant where they're gonna clean the water through a lot of different processes. And then we pump the clean treated water um, and it's tested at various states and then it goes back out into a local large waterway. So we actually have two in Portland. Um, our largest plant is the Columbia Boulevard Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, and that pumps most of our waste or cleaned wastewater out into the Columbia River, which is a really substantial water body. Um, and then we have a smaller plant um, that pumps into the Willamette River, which actually cuts our city in half. So it's a little smaller, but still a really large waterway. Um, and then, so that's the sewage side, but then there's also the stormwater. So when it's raining and that rainwater is hitting any kind of impervious surface, it's going down storm drains and there's a couple areas it can end up. Um, so it's either gonna get funneled out to a local stream, taking whatever it picked up along the way with it. Um, so that's not ideal, but sometimes we're also able to put that underground um, and let it kind of filter in through the ground slowly and get cleaned that way. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that's the separate system. And then there's a different type of um, system which is called a combined sewer system. Um, and so that's where, uh, and it's really common in a lot of cities. Um, so it's where anything leaving a house or going down a drain is also meeting up with that storm water. Uh, and on a typical day, that's fine. Uh, and we can manage all of that for getting rain um, or sunshine, and that all gets sent to the plant to get treated. Um, when that becomes a problem is when we actually get really heavy rainstorms. So either really intense rains uh, that cause some flooding, um, or if we're having sustained rain for a long period of time, people are still washing their dishes, doing their laundry, um, then we come to a capacity issue where our pipes just can't handle all that extra storm water. Um, and so we have what we call a CSO or a combined sewer overflow. And that's when some of that water that's coming in from those impervious surfaces is just overwhelming the system. And then we have an overflow into the local water body, which typically in Portland is the Willamette River. So we have to kind of send out alerts, say we're not allowed to go into the water or interact with the water for the next 48 hours until enough fresh water kind of clears that out. Okay. 
All right, so this is a picture of Portland, um, just to give people kind of their orientation here. So um, Portland is a mid-sized city. We're about 160 or 160, 650,000 people. Um, you can see the Willamette River is going right through the middle of our city. So we have lots of bridges. Um, the orientation, the half or the upper side of this picture, um, that is the west side of the city. That's where we tend to have um, a lot of hills, a lot more elevation, a lot steeper. That's where Forest Park is located. So we've also got a lot of um, trees and uh, natural areas over there. And then on the lower half of the photo, um, that is the east side of the city. Uh, it tends to be more flat. Um, the soil on that side is actually a little more sandy and gravelly. It filters really well. Uh, whereas the west side has more clay-based soils that kind of hold on to water and can cause some um, complicated drainage issues, especially with the, the hill system that we've got over there. Um, so Oregon, or the city of Portland is about 140 square miles. And if you're trying to calculate how much impervious surface is in that area, we've got about 20 square miles of rooftops, uh, 14 square miles of streets, 27 square miles of pavement, and we get about 41 inches of rain every year, which creates about 20 billion gallons of stormwater that we have to manage. Uh, and so I just want to talk a little bit about um, the impact of stormwater and combined sewers. So when Portland built its sewer system, that was about 80 to 120 years ago. So a lot of what our bureau does is looking at um, capacity issues for pipes that were built a really long time ago, which ones are failing, um, which ones need to be increased in size because our population has grown so much and is continuing to grow. Um, but when they were originally built, um, all the pipes that flowed into local waterways were not treated at all. Just any kind of sewage or chemicals or anything that people just wanted to get rid of just went right into um, the Willamette River mainly and then another body of water called, body of water called the Columbia Slough, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so about one third of Portland has combined sewers. That's kind of like the initial um, settlement or urbanization of Portland. And so when Portland has those heavy rainfalls, that's when we have our overflows. But what we're gonna do is just show a quick video and there's no sound, um, but it shows you what the Willamette River looked like before there was any treatment or laws about um, protecting waterways. Effluent's just a word for uh, untreated water. So you can see the harbor is super industrialized, a lot of nasty stuff going right into the Lamet River, um, pretty much eating up all of the oxygen in the water. So not many animals could live in there. Um, these scientists are actually doing a little experiment to see how long some juvenile salmon could survive. And they've got a little timer, so not, not very long. <laughs> Although there are um, some animals that are more tolerant to poor water quality. Um, so you could see with that person fishing, there was still some things in there. Um, people were kind of eating fish from the river, but you can imagine it wasn't um, 
a very good option if you could avoid it. Yeah, so that's a, a pretty intense uh, video that just shows how bad things were before we had environmental, environmental protections. Uh, and a lot of those laws that were put into place later um, helped kind of set the scene for our agency to come into um, being as a regulatory agency. So we monitor what's going into the river. We try to protect that and clean it um, so that we can have healthier waterways to protect salmon, uh, provide shelter and habitat and make sure that the water can support them. Because we do have some streams in Portland that are um, salmon spawning streams. And some we're working to re-establish um, as salmon spawning streams. Um, so this is just another map of Portland. And the stats at the lower corner are a little old. As you can see, our population has gotten higher. Um, and we've also noticed over time that because of different climate changes, um, we're getting more rain. So we have to kind of start planning how we're gonna manage more rainfall over time and how we're gonna um, build capacity into our system. Um, but I did wanna point out just a couple of important bodies of water. So we've got the Willamette River that splits our city east and west. Um, this map shows about one third of our system is combined sewers. So that has the potential to overflow uh, if we're getting too much rain, rainwater, excuse me. And then uh, I pointed out the Columbia Slough. Um, so a slough is a pretty special type of water body. Um, sloughs, yeah, they kind of go from, it starts off at Fairview Lake, you can see um, kind of the two little long skinny rivers outside of the city boundary line. And those just sort of weave their way through the north and northeast part of Portland until they meet um, at the Willamette River right before it flows into the Columbia River, which is that larger body of water um, at the top side of the map. And so the Columbia Slough is an old floodplain. Uh, most of the water in there gets, or it's generated from groundwater. Um, and sloughs are interesting because they're pretty skinny. Um, they have a lot of sediment at the bottom they are really slow moving. Um, we actually have an agency that pumps the water periodically to make sure that um, levels are monitored uh, and to kind of flush water out at times. Um, but that is one of the water bodies where effluent was just dumped into the river. There was a lot of industry up there. Um, there was actually a couple slaughterhouses up there that anything that they didn't need from the animals just went right into the slough. And the problem with that is that it would just sit because um, there wasn't much movement of the water. So at least in the Willamette River, it's kind of clearing out in about two days, whereas the Columbia Slough, Columbia Slough it just kind of sits there. So contamination in that area is a little harder to get moving on its way. Let me see if I had anything else I wanted to mention about that. No, okay. Um, so we have this problem in Portland where when we get really heavy rainfalls, we have these overflows. Um, and so the city actually got sued and the EPA was saying, you need to do a better job of taking care of your rivers and streams. Like we did install a treatment plant in 1952. Um, we advanced our treatment processes. Um, but we were still getting those overflows whenever we had really intense rainstorms. So we used to get about 50 overflows per year. Um, and this is still common in a lot of places in the United States. Um, I think uh, in the DC area, there's actually um, issues there with a lot of overflows into their system. So Portland's kind of been a leader uh, in these green infrastructure initiatives. Um, so we did a 20 year long project um, we didn't get any federal funding, so it was all paid by um, local Portland residents. So whenever, as a resident, you get your um, sewer and store or sewer and water bill, they're combined. Um, you actually are helping pay for the infrastructure. And so this project took 20 years, um, but when it was completed in 2011, we had a 94% reduction in overflows to the Willamette River 
and a 99% reduction to the Columbia Slough, which is a really sensitive area. So that's um, really exciting. Um, so we went from about 50 a year to now we have about four overflow events each winter because that's our rainy season and about one every third summer. Uh, and people may ask, well, why didn't you go for 100%? Um, like no overflows ever. Well, that was because the project cost um, local residents $1.4 billion. And if we had gone to um, eliminate any overflows, it would have doubled that cost. Um, so we decided to come up with some other solutions to help with this um, big pipe project. And just to give you um, an idea, the big pipe project, so that was one big pipe on the east side, one big pipe on the west side, think like driving a big city bus through them. So a lot more capacity. And then one along the Columbia Slough watershed that heads to our main treatment plant. Um, so I did mention earlier with the separated system. So about two thirds of Portland system is separated. Um, so that stormwater is either going into a local waterway or we can put it underground. And so we have these things called underground injection control systems, which we also call UICs. Um, they're a type of sump, uh, and that takes the stormwater runoff from the streets and anything it's picking up, um, and it goes towards a manhole, and you can see in the visual, there's one area where the pipes kind of flow in, and that's able to catch any sort of trash, and then it goes into um, an area where there's a pipe that goes pretty deep down into the ground, and it's surrounded by like a gravel and sand mix. Um, we test ahead of time to make sure that they're high enough above the groundwater that um, it's able to take the water, let it soak through those little holes in the pipe, and then it goes into the ground, soaks down towards the groundwater, and by the time it gets there, it's cleaned naturally. So we're using natural systems to clean our water. Um, so the city has about 9,000 UICs that we manage and monitor. And there's other types of smaller UICs um, that you can use on your own private property. They're just smaller, they're the same kind of idea, and we have a program that helps people uh, install those. And then just to note, these only take stormwater. So this is a, a element of a separated system, so no sewage. <laughs> Um, and this is a photo of some students that I was working with at a local school. We have a program where sometimes it's a, they'll want to do a little bit of community service. And so we have a stormwater curb marking activity where we print out maps and we take small groups of students and we go out and we glue these round um, medallions that say things like uh, only stormwater down the storm drain or drains to stream just to raise awareness. Um, that people kind of need to make sure that, you know, whatever's going down those streams is not gonna pollute. So I do have one video that I wanna show. It's about eight minutes long, it's pretty long, um, but it does a really great job of doing an overview of why stormwater is such a problem in urbanized areas. Um, so we're gonna watch that, and you may need to turn up the volume on your own computer um, to hear this a little better. Um, so we'll just watch this for a little bit, so enjoy. Laura James has been diving in Puget Sound for over 20 years. Just the feeling of being famous. It's just like flying. Animals are fantastic and, and so different than anything you'll ever see up here on the surface. It's kind of like going into Wonderland. I don't think that people realize what a gym we have. The Emerald City so much light. The cold water uh, has more nutrients. It can hold more oxygen, hold more nutrients than warm water. So you get tremendous invertebrate marine life in the octopus and bull tails and all sorts of sea slugs, just every color of the rainbow. The wild and crazy animals you see underwater, they're kind of like Alice in Wonderland. To me, a little bit, you go beneath the sea and it's you're in this different world and it's mesmerizing and brilliant. In addition to the abundant life, James also witnesses a deadly form of pollution. We come along and we see this decaying swath, black and 
dead leaves, and like garbage, bubblegum wrappers, and the straws, like stir straws from um, coffee and coffee, coffee cup lids, and very random things. And it, it didn't, I didn't understand what I was seeing. One day she came across something in the water that has haunted her ever since. I went up the slope and I saw what looked like a pilot. It was this big black column. And, and as we got closer, I realized that it was actually a storm outfall. And it was so full of um, road grime and who knows what, that it, it, it was just black. And it was just billowing and billowing. And it, was, it just doesn't stop. When I saw that stuff flowing into Puget Sound, I was just like, what is in this? And I first went home and I started looking it up on the internet. I'm like, what's in stormwater? And I'm like, we don't want that there. Stormwater is a toxic cocktail of sediment, grease, tire wear, and any litter small enough to slip into storm drains. And that's just what you can see. There's much more we can't see. Microscopic particles of heavy metals like copper and zinc are commonly found in urban highway runoff. There's also oil and petroleum-based hydrocarbons. Contrary to what a lot of people think, runoff is Puget Sound's biggest source of pollution. Approximately 50% of the region believe that stormwater is treated, is captured and conveyed for treatment to a treatment plant of some type. Um, when in fact this doesn't take place, and almost all of this water goes off but with untreated. Throughout the United States, so much land has been paved over that the total amount of impervious surfaces would cover an area the size of Ohio. Every time water washes over these hard surfaces, pollutants pour into the nearest waterway. All these impervious surfaces means that water can't get through them, whereas if it rains in the forest, the water hits the ground and then very slowly seeps into the soil. And the soil acts like a sponge. It slows down the water, it cleans the water out, filters it. Uh, and obviously uh, an impervious surface like pavement just doesn't do that at all. Jennifer McIntyre is leading a team that's studying how polluted runoff impacts aquatic animals. The team recently collected runoff from a highway in Seattle and trucked it down to the Washington Stormwater Center. It's one of the only facilities in the world that's conducting cutting edge research on what's known as green stormwater infrastructure. Green stormwater infrastructure is building stormwater control structures that more closely mimic natural settings. Things like rain gardens, bioswales, green roofs. These are developing facilities or things that, that help improve water quality that are trying to mimic those natural filtration aspects of water infiltrating into the ground or flowing through vegetation. Around the Northwest and across the country, new rules are being written that would require cities and counties to adopt green stormwater methods. But this prospect is causing some concern. Because green stormwater methods, such as rain gardens, are relatively new, little is known about them, or even whether they can make any difference. People are are running out there and just building rain gardens. And that's great, but there is the potential for them not to work because we don't know very much about them yet. So some of the things that we're hoping to learn here at this facility are, what are the best soil mixtures to use? What are the best plants to use? Um, how long will these systems hold up to, to a continuous input of contaminants coming from stormwater runoff? We know that they reduce some of the contaminants that are in stormwater, we know that the flows can be reduced. These are all really good things, but is that enough? Is that enough to protect wild fish and their food webs from some of the harmful effects of stormwater runoff? That's what McIntyre is trying to find out. Came out of the truck, the ones that are cold, and you can start, yeah. Oh. Once all the stormwater was mixed and samples were taken, the team filtered half the water through soil columns that mimic what happens in a rain garden. They then filled a series of aquariums, half with the straight highway runoff, 
and half of runoff that had gone through rain garden filtration. And each aquarium got 10 juvenile coho salmon. And pretty much we waited to see what would happen. Her plan was to monitor the salmon for four days. But within 12 hours, all the fish that were in the straight highway runoff were dead. Hmm. And the fish in the filtered runoff, all still alive. I think it's really telling that we can take something as, as concentrated and toxic as highway runoff and pass it through soil columns and have it no longer be acute and lethal to fish. While Jennifer McIntyre searches for answers in the lab, Laura James is trying to raise awareness in the real world by documenting the effects of stormwater with her camera. If I can capture this on film, if I can share this, it will truly give our water a voice. Because people see it and they're just, it's like shock. They stop what they're doing and they actually look. It's like a connection. I see Puget Sound in our oceans as a reflection of us. They're a reflection of our humanity. And the storm drains are like a conduit of our humanity running in there. It's everybody's problem and it's everybody's solution. We can't expect the government or the nonprofits or all these other entities, we can't expect them to fix it for us. We have to fix it. Yeah, that's it. Um, that is uh, a video that was produced mostly out of Seattle, um, but it's really similar in Portland. And I just like that it really shows you how the green infrastructure impacts um, and cleans the stormwater. So we're focusing on uh, allowing it to cool down, get filtered and clean naturally, uh, and slow down that stormwater. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Svetlana to talk more about specifics of green infrastructure. Thanks, Krista. <clears throat> so, so remember when Krista was saying that we manage only 94% of our stormwater with a pipe system? Well, what to do with the rest of the 6% that left um, untreated? So we manage it by green infrastructure. And Portland has experimented with many different types of green solutions. Uh, so some of these include uh, pervious pavement, um, um, downspout disconnection program. I will talk a little bit um, um, more in more details in a little bit. Uh, rain gardens, uh, tree planting, um, green walls, and eco roofs. <clears throat> so pervious pavements or um, uh, pavers are um, fascinating things. Uh, because they allowed stormwater to soak um, through the gaps and the cracks and allow that water to go into the ground. So similarly to what we will see um, in the forest, except this would be also through the soil, no vegetation. So it's a great solution for walkways and driveways and light foot traffic. It's also helped us to reduce combined sewer overflows into the river uh, since water sips into the ground. Um, and we are still doing um, testing for effectiveness of pervious asphalt and concrete. So there's lots of research to be done on those. So our downspout disconnection program um, started in 1993 and ended in 2011. And um, this pro pro through this program, we disconnected over 56,000 downspouts from the city's combined sewer system in, the, in that target area that was the darker green on the map that um, Krista was showing. Um, through this program, we removed over 1.3 billion gallons of stormwater from Portland's combined sewer system each year. So it's a big successful story for us. So um, 
from dance quality this connection program um, um rain garden program was born we call it the private property retrofit pro program and um it also happens in uh, combined sewer areas and we provide provide free rain garden installation to a residential area, to residents, uh, businesses, and industrial properties as well. And we disconnect the downspout for them and um, put that storm water from their roof onto their uh, property by building rain gardens. And that program was is free for the homeowners and businesses. So tree planting. Um, our tree pl planting program started about 11 years ago, and we planted um, over 50,000 trees in, uh, in Portland through that program. And we plant trees two different ways, one with partners and the other one with the contractors. So uh, with the contractors, we plant trees next to businesses or multifamily residential areas um, or industrial areas. So the pictures before and after right here, you can see this is a, uh, one of the industrial um, areas that didn't have any trees. And we partner with the owner of that um, industrial building and um, ask them if they would like to sign up and uh, plant trees with us. So we remove the pavement um and then plant trees and that is free uh, for anybody who wants to have trees and for the uh, continuous four years we water those trees and we maintain them to make sure we prune them structurally to make sure that they are, um, look good um, and actually have a good start and then the other way we plant trees is with partners uh, you can see that in the these two pictures and uh, our partner is friends of trees and uh, they do outreach to the single family residential um, property owners and ask them if they would like to sign up and then um, it's uh, with the volunteer efforts lots of people come out and one day um, you know in the uh, fall and spring people get together and plant trees with their neighbors and get to know each other. So it's a wonderful program and um, it's it's been really successful. Um, another green infrastructure that we still experiment is um, are green walls. And um, these two particular ones, the one that looked like a geisha and this one, are the green walls that actually been irrigated by irrigation system that is connected in the back of that wall. And they're doing okay. Um, I mean, the, the whole idea of it is to be artistic and provide beauty. Uh, this particular one, the bottom picture is the, um, it's a Portland Expo Center. Um, and it's the first, um, green wall of its kind in the United States. It integrates sustainability, art, and science for managing stormwater runoff. And um, it stands 30 feet tall and 60 feet wide, um, long, I guess. <laughs> the freestanding um, artistic structure is made of steel and aluminum and is a, provide, has soils and vegetation native to the Oregon. Um, and they, they actually have ducks um nesting right here on the lower bottom portion of it and actually had babies and um it's just an amazing thing seeing that um wildlife is actually using our green infrastructure um so it's great and um this particular wall is effectively um uh provide storm water filtration for 9400 square foot roof so is a good successful thing. Uh, the next way uh, that we manage stormwater here is by eco roofs, and we have um, 520 extensive eco roofs, which means like a shallow um, system. So it has a shallow uh, medium, so only like four to six inches depth of medium in the roof and uh, those eco roofs um, 
cover 34 acres if you put them all together. And they reduce um, approximately 70 million gallons from our system per year. So they help us a lot with this. And in addition, of course, stormwater benefits, they also provide habitat for the insects and birds. They reduce urban heat island effect and insulating the buildings in the summer and winter and uh, filter our air. So. Um, Green streets. Um, so green streets is an umbrella term that we describe rain gardens, swales, and um, curb extensions. So a curb extension is basically a, a rain garden that is extends into the street a little bit to making the street a little smaller. We use those mostly in the areas that have schools, so pedestrian can actually cross um, a, a shorter amount of road in order to get to school. And rain gardens, um, term rain gardens is uh, used for um, bigger green infrastructure um, areas like this picture right here. So the benefits of green streets, of course, is uh, reducing of peak flow during the storm events. Um, it's a cost effective alternative. It reduces the um, combined sewer overflow events and basement sewer backups in the combined sewer areas um, for the um, um, residential households. There are environmental benefits that um, water is actually recharged, the groundwater um, increases tree canopy, rehabilitation of the soil, cleans and cool urban air and improve water quality in the streams. And then community benefits is a pedestrian bike safety uh, beautification of the neighborhood and just making it a nice place instead of just a pipe underground that nobody sees. It's an actual uh, vegetative garden that is exposed to the surface. So we have over tw um, 2,400 green streets in Portland and uh, you can see it on the map and there in the green dashes. Um, and you can see that they are spread out a little bit, but if you remember the map that uh, Krista showed, this, this is roughly our combined sewer area right here. And this was the, our first installations of Green Streets. And it, all the other areas outside of this is the mandatory areas. Um, so for anybody who is building a newly developed they require to manage the stormwater uh, runoff from their roof on site, and so they require to build some sort of green infrastructure. Um, in Portland, if you disturb a uh, 500 square feet area, you are required to put in uh, some sort of green infrastructure. It could be UACs as well, underground injection systems, or green streets, or eco roof, or some sort of green infrastructure to manage that stormwater. So with so many um, green streets around Portland, <clears throat> the, um, the city of Portland sends out crews that manage the um, maintenance of those um, green streets. They, we, we prune vegetation if necessary, we remove the um, trash and debris to uh, from the opening so the water can actually enter the facilities. Um, but in um, 2010, when we were building um, a lot of green streets in one particular area due to the uh, new development, we had interest from residents to um, adapt and look after the um, stormwater facilities that we build in their neighborhood. And that's how the Green Street Steward program was born. And so the goal was to recruit residents and businesses and other nonprofits to care of for Green Streets um, and supplement our maintenance visits since we can uh, come and visit every um, three to four months. Um, and it's also built civic infrastructure to protect and maintain our investment. Um, with that, we also provide education and training and support volunteers through this program. Um, 
this cultivated sense of ownership and responsibilities uh, for green infrastructure assets that um, advanced watershed health, stormwater management, and livability. So th there are, um, I'll give you a little statistics and I'll show you a little video uh, that we created about how to maintain the green streets in Portland. So as I mentioned, uh, program started in 2010 and it was a six month pilot in that particular target areas. Uh, we created a maintenance guide, developed a little web page with a registration process. We sent out letters to the uh, neighbors and residents who lived in that particular neighborhood and we've got 5% um, response from them. So with that, um, in, a little bit later in 2012, we, we began the program citywide, and um, I was hired uh, as an AmeriCorps member um, for a year and a half to develop the program a little bit more. And so now I'm actually playing um, in that role, be, being hired to be uh, the manager of that program. And to this, to the present. Um, we have uh, 579 Green Streets adopted by 231 uh, volunteers. And this, um, this table, the graph shows you um, year by year, um, new stewards being adopted, um, new facilities being adopted by new stewards. So it's kind of progress uh, from year to year. So I'm gonna show you a brief um, three, minute video about um, our program and how it works. And I turn on the captions so you guys can see what it says. Thank you for becoming a Green Street student. This video will show you how to take care of your Green Street, keep it working well and looking zesty. Before you begin, it's important to be safe and dress for the occasion. You'll also want to have a few tools on hand. This pair of fashionable gloves will protect your hands, and a flashy vest will help people traveling by car, bicycle, wheelchair, or on foot notice the fine work you are doing for the neighbor. A trash grab, rake, and bucket will make your job a snap, and if you don't have them, we can provide some. For your safety, only work during daylight hours. And if your adopted Green Street is in a high traffic area, make sure you work during times when the traffic is light. Now let's get to work. Green streets work best when water flows in easily, then soaks slowly into the soil to be absorbed by nearby plants. So a clean green street is a working green street. The first step is to remove trash and natural debris, such as leaves, sticks, and branches. These items can keep water from soaking into the ground. Plus, trash tends to look a little trashy. Next, clear the curb openings and tops of the overflow drain. Fine sediments and grit belong in the trash, not in compost or yard debris bin, because they can carry pollutants from the street. Now it's time to do some weeding. If you need help identifying a plant as a weed, Check out our weed identification guide available online. You can also send us a picture. We love pictures. If you aren't sure, just keep it in. During extra dry periods in the summer, you may water the plants. In street, this is especially important to help new plants get established. More information on the care and keeping up your green street is in the Green Street Stewards Maintenance Guide, available online. Want to kick it up a notch? You can personalize your Green Street by adding new plants. Not all plants work well in Green Streets. They have to handle both extreme rains and summer dry periods. So all new plants have to be approved by environmental services before being installed. Just call us first or fill out pages 15 and 16 in the maintenance guide. Finally, we need to hear about all the great work you are doing. Every three months, we will send out a request for your activity log. Please fill out the log and send it back to us by email or mail. 
tracking this information is important because it helps us figure out how much our volunteers are contributing to clean streets and healthy rivers. Every year we add up the results and give out awards for stewards who are the most active. When you adopt the green street, you're contributing to clean rivers and a great neighborhood. If you have any questions, feel free to get in touch. Thanks for your help. So hopefully you enjoyed that. And I think that is pretty much the end of our presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Krista and Solana. Um, so if anyone had another question they wanted to ask, now would be the time into the question box. Um, we do have a couple of a couple of questions from folks. Um, one was about um, about green roofs or eco roofs. Are there any structural requirements for building roofs to be able to hold all of the soil and plants and water? I can I can answer that. Um, Yes, there are. Um, we used to have like a whole team devoted to um, helping businesses that were interested in putting a green roof or an eco roof on. Um, it does have to be able to support the additional weight. Um, I don't know exactly what those parameters are, but I know that we do have consultants that we can refer people to um, and specialists that help work on that. Um, and there is always an overflow because we don't want to put too much water just sitting uh, and like flooding on the roof because that would be too much uh, water to hold in that area. Um, so there is an overflow area for all of our green infrastructure so that it doesn't just get flooded. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> that helps. Um, a similar question that's not about the roof, but um, in uh rain garden or in the green streets or the swales do soils or permeable materials ever reach capacity for filtering and need replacing um i can answer that one um no so we have the program started in 1993 or 91 i think was the first installation of a um fire swell in the area and periodically in the high traffic areas we come and remove the sediment uh, because it's um, microscopic, greedy, small part particulates that um, cover the top um, soils. But um, it's still our soil structure is mostly sand for those facilities. So they still uh, drain um, in a reasonable amount and there is no standing water for longer than 48 hours. Hi, that sounds great. Um, this, this is from a slightly different angle, angle, excuse me, but in Portland, are developers removing topsoils from construction sites? Are they, are there any requirements to leaving sufficient topsoil or some sort of plants in order to absorb runoff during construction or after? Uh, or is, I have no idea. Is that in your real house or no? <laughs> I have no idea. I know that I know that when we have construction projects, environmental services does work with um, contractors to make sure that um, they're setting up their site so that they don't get a lot of runoff because um, a lot of new soil can be eroded and just sent into storm drains. So they do set up like um, little uh, mesh bags that'll, that are full of like hay or other materials or they'll um, kind of block off storm drains so that they go through that first so any kind of sediment gets picked up. Um, and I'm, you know, they all, it's a long process of going through like development and getting all the permits. So I imagine that's mostly taken care of through there, but new construction is required. Like we're having a lot of uh, new construction for a lot of our um, high schools to make them earthquake ready. Um, and so any changes they're making on those facilities, they have to put the green infrastructure in to manage the stormwater. 
Um, so yeah, I'm not totally sure about the topsoil part, but I know that there's a lot of mitigation that takes place throughout the whole project until they do get the green infrastructure in there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and then Svetlana, these questions are for you because they're specifically about green streets, but um, what is the maintenance schedule or just overall overview of maintenance like for green streets and are you totally dependent on the stewards um, for that and how long does a green street last for before it needs maintenance or rehab of some kind so it depends so the our maintenance crews the city maintenance crews come and come visit a facility every three, once every three to four months. So that's on the schedule. That does not uh, mean that if facility is adopted by volunteer that we will not come in. We will still come and visit those that facility. Uh, the idea is that if there is a volunteer who's taking care of that facility, they will spend less time at this particular facility uh, to uh, cleaning it right they might do some pruning um, or removing sediment if necessary but um, they will spend less time um, removing trash and weeds if the volunteer is there so hopefully that uh, answers that question and uh, again depending on the um, placement of the green street near you know if the green street is located near bus stop or um, high traffic areas, it's obviously going to receive a lot more uh, trash and debris probably that will clog the entrances. So that particular uh, um, green street will be visited by our crew more often. Or if the, or if the green street is um, uh, in, in close proximity to the uh, park, for example, so in the fall, lots of foliage might be falling down and blocking those entrances. So we have um, our <clears throat> supervisors, maintenance supervisors know of those particular uh, green streets and they will send out the crews more often during those periods of time, like in the fall, for, for example. Yeah. But that maintenance is mostly um, trash and making sure any passageways aren't blocked as opposed to replanting them. Correct. So if people want to add additional vegetation, they have to submit the paperwork to us to make sure so we can make sure that one, we know that this particular green street been altered by our uh, volunteers. So when our maintenance crew will come in, so they will not um, take out the vegetation that's just been put in by our volunteers, but volunteers would also be um, required to water their newly planted vegetation. So for their success, we encourage them to plant during spring and fall time. Okay. Um, also for you, Svetlana, um, Roberta asks, I've heard mixed messages about trees in Green Streets. What kinds of trees do and don't work in a Green Street or Green Garden? So it depends again on the location and I, I can't name you certain ones that work better than others. Um, I know that black tupelo, we have some with black tupelo. Uh, we have some birches that we planted, although we are staying away from birch trees uh, for now because our birch borers, um, the insects are getting active right now. So they seems to kill quite a bit of our birch trees. So we are looking into other options. Um, I know that we have some um, alders and um, some other trees. Yeah, I can't name you all. If you're mm -hmm. interested, you're welcome to send me an email and uh, or provide your information and I will do the research for you. Okay, thank you. Um, and then one last question that might be a bit of a doozy. Uh, what are some of the most toxic chemicals found in stormwater um, runoff, and what are the what are their sources? Um, 
I think some of the really nasty stuff, so there's obviously like oils and gases or anything else that gets spilled on like streets or roads, antifreeze. Um, some of those heavy metals I'd say are probably the most toxic. So a lot of those come from like um, your brake pads, um, as they wear down, they deposit like dust on the street. And so that could be like lead or copper. Um, and that can get washed into the green streets. Um, copper particularly can be a problem because it inhibits, um, the salmon from being able to smell, which is how they find their way back to their spawning grounds. Um, so yeah, I'd say mainly like those kind of heavy metals, although pesticides and fertilizers are also a big problem because if those are going right into um, local streams and rivers, they can cause those algae blooms. Um, so you have this really huge growth of a whole bunch of plants um, because they're getting all these nutrients from the fertilizers um, and then they kind of coat a whole area. And then when that algae or those plants start to decompose, the process of decomposition um, uses up a bunch of the oxygen in the water. So that can cause um, massive fish kill offs. Um, there's also that type of algae, the um, green blue algae that um, creates a toxin um, that can uh, be harmful to people and especially pets. That can be really bad for the environment. Um, that's all the time we have for q and A. I I know there are a couple of questions left off. Um, if you have any pressing questions for Krista and Svetlana, you can email us at sos at iwla.org mm -hmm. and we will pass them along. Um, the recording of this webinar will be available both on our website and I believe we will email it to you as well. Um, so that's all for now, and we'll see you next time. And thank you so much, Krista and Svetlana. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us.